This conference will now be recorded. All right, so I can see Hamsani there. Okay. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, I think so. Shreya also joined. All right, so it's exactly 3 p.m. by my watch. So uh, let us begin the session. So I'll be continuing with the further properties and today is going to be the most uh, important of all properties. I'll be starting with the Leibniz rule. Okay. So today I'll be starting with the Leibniz rule. As you all know, Leibniz was a co-inventor of calculus along with Newton. And he gave a very important rule of finding the derivative of a function which has been integrated. Okay. So that's why we call this rule as derivative under the integral sign. Derivative under the integral sign. Okay. Hope everybody can see the screen and I'm audible to all of you. In case of any query, any concern, please do type it on the chat box. You can also speak. I have not uh, muted anyone. Okay. All of you are free to speak today and ask questions. Great. Yeah. So, what is this rule? What is this property? Let's say you have a function, okay, which you are integrating with respect to t. But the limits of these functions are functions of x. So let's say you are integrating from phi of x to psi of x, okay, where phi x and psi x are some functions of x, okay, and you want to differentiate this result with respect to x of course you know that if you integrate this and put your limits which are already a function of x your answer would also be in terms of x right correct and if you want to differentiate that result this rule actually helps us to find that very efficiently if you don't know this rule what would you otherwise do you would actually integrate this Correct. Put the upper limit, put the lower limit, subtract, right? So in the primitive of the function, you will put the upper limit, you'll put the lower limit, you'll subtract, and whatever you get, you are going to in differentiate that. But this is time consuming because many a times you'll get such functions which are difficult to integrate, and many a times you don't need those results also. So why would you go through a longer process to achieve it when there is a shorter one available? And that's what Lay's rule says. Okay, so Leibniz rule says that this result is going to be f of psi x into derivative of psi x minus f of phi into derivative of phi x. Okay, hello, Paris. Good afternoon, and uh, wish you all a happy Ganesh Chaturthi today. Same Hope you, puja sir. and all is done. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so this is what this rule says and you can see in this rule that there is nowhere I have integrated the function. I'm working with f itself. Okay, so what I did, let me explain what I've written over here. I first put the upper limit in place of t, right? So uh, psi x, this is pronounced as psi. This is phi, psi and phi, okay? So this upper limit was put in place of t in the function 
and it was multiplied to the derivative of the upper limit okay with respect to x of course minus then the lower limit was put in place of t and multiplied with the derivative of the lower limit right okay now first of all from where does this formula actually come right what is the proof for this formula the proof for this formula is very simple and straightforward it actually comes from your understanding of fundamental theorem of calculus and the use of chain rule on that okay so let's say there was no derivative let's say i had asked you to evaluate integral from phi x to psi x of f of t dt correct now assuming that your capital f let your capital f of x be the primitive be the primitive of small f of x what is the meaning of primitive it means it means if you differentiate your capital f of x you are going to get your small f of x okay so small f of x is called the derivative capital f of x is called the primitive okay so this result would have been capital f of psi x minus capital f of phi x right no doubt about that hi ritu good afternoon happy ganesh chaturthi to you okay now we need to differentiate this result so let's say we are finding the derivative of this result okay so whatever is the answer of this integration i am going to differentiate that with respect to x okay remember your answer is a function of x okay so you are differentiating with respect to x so it just means you are trying to differentiate capital f of psi x minus capital f of phi x yes or no okay correct now if you differentiate such a function we need to use our chain rule for that so we write it as f dash psi x into psi dash x minus f dash phi x into phi dash x so far so good okay no problem in understanding this so this is through fundamental theorem of calculus we all know this is ftc fundamental theorem of calculus okay so what i did i wrote the fundamental theorem of calculus i differentiated both sides with respect to x and on the right hand side i applied chain rule so this result comes from the application of chain rule which we all know very well right now see what i'll do we already know that capital f is the primitive of small f of x correct so this formula is known to us okay so whatever we put as x here the same will be reflected here also right so as you can see here you are put you are finding f capital f dash phi x so if you place your x with psi x won't this become f of psi x correct so what i have done is this x which i am showing with the arrow sign see the motion of my pen i have replaced it with psi x so my result will also be small f of psi x correct and this i'll copy as such psi x again this will become f of phi x and this will become phi dash x is that fine okay and this is what your leibniz rule actually says this is what we had actually written over here okay as you can see this is the result which we had written over here and hence proved okay so hope the process was very clear to you so at any stage of this evaluation you never needed capital f of x that means you never needed the primitive of small f of x so never needed to apply integration at all right so this becomes so simple to evaluate that you don't have to take a longer route okay now i'll give you an example to understand this let us have an example hope there is no question so far okay
I cannot see this guy. Aditya, today. Okay, anyways, fine. Any questions so far, guys? No? Okay. Let's move on to the example on this. I'll give you a simple example to understand this. Uh, let us say your function is y, which is integral of 1 by log t dt. And you are integrating from x square to x cube. You are integrating from x square to x cube. Okay. X is a positive quantity here. Then the question is find dy by dx. Find dy by dx. The question is find dy by dx in this case. Okay, would you like to try? Everyone, would you like to give it a try? Just try it out. I'll, I'll rewrite the formula for you over here if you have not copied it. It says that the derivative of the integral from phi x to psi x, phi x and psi x being some functions of x of a function f of t dt is given as f of psi x into derivative of psi x minus f of phi x into derivative of phi x. Okay. So please do give it a try. And once done, just type in done on your uh, chat box so that I can discuss it. It should just take you one minute, not more than that. I think lesser than a minute. So use Leibniz rule. Done. Okay, share is done. So what I'm going to do is, as I already written in the formula, first I'm going to put upper limit in place of t. Okay, so when you put upper limit, so it will become something like this. dy by dx is equal to 1 by log upper limit. When you put it, it will become log x cube into derivative of x cube. Derivative of x cube is 3x square minus. Now put the lower limit in place of t, which is log x square into derivative of x square, which is going to be 2x. Okay, now you can simplify it uh, the way you want to. So 3x squared and this becomes 3 log x. We all know the log properties. This becomes minus 2x by 2 log x. Uh, we can cancel off 3, 3 factor and here and I can take a 1 by log x common. And of course we can take an x common on top. So it becomes x x minus 1 by log x. Okay. And the reason why they have given x should be positive is because they want log to be a defined function. Okay, so this becomes your answer. Remember 1 by log x is a non-integrable function. That means the integration of 1 by log x cannot be expressed. Okay, so there are some lists of functions which you cannot integrate like sine x by x, cos x by x, e to the power x square, e to the power minus x square, x square by 1 plus x to the power 5, 1 by log x. So this belongs to that group where you cannot find the integration of this. So 90% of the people would, who do not know these formulas will be like, you know, breaking their head how to integrate this and then I, I can do the process of differentiation. Okay. So no need to go through the process of integration at all if you are following the Leibniz rule. Okay. Hope it makes sense. Everyone. Any question, please do ask because this rule is very, very important. Some of the most difficult questions have been framed on this and students are sometimes clueless that a Leibniz rule would be required for this. Okay, now I'm going to give you a general idea or the general overview. Of the Leibniz rule. Okay. Generalization of the Leibniz rule. So if you have a function which is a multivariate function, that means it has x also in it and it has t also in it, right? What is the typical example of a multivariate function like this? Something like see x squared t plus uh, t uh, by x to the power 4, okay? So this is a function which is both in terms of x and t. So this is a multivariate function, okay? In the prior example which I cited, it was a, it was a single variable function, right? t. But this time my function, let's say it has, 
it has more than one variable in case let's say we can say it has two variables x and t okay now if i want to if i want to integrate this function if i want to integrate this function okay with respect to t from phi x to psi x mind you you are integrating it with respect to t not x so x would be treated like a constant are you getting my point so integration is happening with respect to which variable integration is happening with respect to t not x so while the process of integration is happening x would be like a constant x would behave like a constant because it is being integrated with respect to t so t is a variable here okay but remember your upper and lower limit are functions of x again phi x and psi x right that means after integrating wherever you see the t you have to put these functions of x in place of that correct so overall this entire thing overall this integral would be a function of x let's say that function of x i am differentiating with respect to x okay so how would i do this so basically leibniz rule in such a situation gives you a slightly more complicated result it says it will be integral from phi x to psi x of partial derivative of this function fx comma t with respect to x whole integral with respect to t plus f of psi x sorry f of f of x comma psi x into psi dash x minus f of x comma x comma phi x into phi dash x okay and this result i had shared with you in the morning today okay did you get an opportunity to see that how many of you got the opportunity to see that derivation probably would have not understood anything from that derivation but now once you know what is the leibniz rule please go and visit that uh, derivation once again so in the interest of time it is pretty long i think you would have seen the derivation it has run into two pages right correct so in light of that uh, in light of that uh, uh, time saving effort we will not discuss the derivation once again because that is not required first of all and secondly it will take a lot of time so better to see some problems based on this better will appreciate some problems based on this application okay now everybody knows the partial derivative with respect to x partial derivative when you are doing you have to treat only x as a constant uh, sorry x as a variable rest everything will be like a constant so when you do partial derivative with respect to x only x will be treated as a variable rest everything will be like a constant okay and actually the first rule that we did was also the same thing but do you recall that in my first rule there was no x there was there was no x so when you applied leibniz rule on this okay when you applied leibniz rule on, on this the first term here actually when you do the partial derivative of a function which is in terms of t only this actually became a zero term because there is no x over here so there is no point you know writing this term in that rule so this guy actually vanished okay and the rest of the terms yes they did make the appearance so it was f of psi x into psi dash x minus f of phi dash into phi dash x so the first rule which i gave you was actually the same rule and by this rule is the generalized form of the leibniz rule okay is that fine any questions regarding this form so please note down this formula okay there is an additional term over here remember you have to partially differentiate with respect to x and whatever remains you have to integrate with respect to t from phi x to psi x 
and these two results are more or less very similar to what we did in the first form of Leibniz rule. Any questions? You can unmute your mic and speak. No problem. Okay, Hamsini, Shia, Ritu, Paras, Ardara. Rashmi, hello Rashmi, good afternoon, happy Ganesh Chaturthi to you. So no question guys? Good, so let's, let's solve problems on them. Let's, uh, at least for one, one and a half hours, we'll take a lot of problems on Leibniz rule. So let me begin with this question. If, if integral of t square f t, okay, from sine x to one is one minus sine x, okay, where your x belongs to the interval zero to pi by two where your x belongs to the interval 0 to pi by 2. Okay. The question is, find f of 1 by root 3. Find f of 1 by root 3. Remember, my, functions ha my function has not been given to me directly. They have given to me that there is a integral of the function from sine x to one. Okay. And that to the function has been multiplied to t squared. And this result is one minus sine x. Just try out. Once you're done, please type in your answer on the chat box. I'll give you three minutes to try this out. Hint is differentiate both sides with respect to X. Apply Leibniz rule. That's my hint. Yes, anyone? Guys, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, 
let, let me solve this problem. See, it's not very difficult. You just have to apply Leibniz rule on both sides. So let's differentiate both sides with respect to x. So sine x, 1, we have t square f of t dt. Okay. And this also have to differentiate with respect to x. Now, so when you when you apply a Leibniz rule, remember you have to first put the upper limit in place of t and differentiate the upper limit also, right? Now, since this upper limit is a constant, you know that ultimately when you differentiate that constant, it is going to make all the terms zero, right? So don't even waste time doing that. Just write a zero minus, put the lower limit in place of a t, so it becomes sine square um, x into f of sine x, okay? Into derivative of sine x, which we all know is cos x, right? On the right hand side, we get a zero minus cos x. Is that fine? Okay, simple enough. Now, since your x lies between zero to pi by two, you know cos x is not going to become zero. Right? So you can cancel off cos x factor, in fact, minus cos x factor from everywhere. So it leaves you just with sine square x into f of sine x equal to one. Right? So that means f of sine x becomes one by sine square x. Correct? Guys, let me tell you here, whatever you have put over here, the same thing square is being reciprocated as the output of that function, right? So for example, if I put this as y, right, you will read this as one by y square. That means your function is behaving like this. So whatever you are inputting into the function, it is just uh, reciprocating the square of that input. So if I put a one by root three into my uh, input, what will it do to it? One by one by root three square. That's nothing but three. Correct? So this is your answer. Over. Are you getting the point? So there's no need to actually know the function to you know uh, solve this. You can easily apply Leibniz rule and it makes your effort so, so less in this. Is this clear? Please type CLR on your chat box if it is clear. Ani Hamsini and Ardara, Samyukta, Rashmi, Shreya. Okay, great. Okay, well, I'm sure you would like to solve more problems on this. So let's move on. So next question, let there be a function defined from real numbers to real numbers. Okay, and this is a differentiable function. Okay, the function is derivable. Okay. This function satisfies the following characteristics. F2 is 6. F dash 2 is 1 by 48. Okay. Then question is evaluate. Evaluate. Limit x tending to 2. Integral of. 4t cube by x minus 2 dt from 6 to f of x. So what do you have to evaluate? You have to evaluate the limit of this particular function, which itself is an integral of 4t cube by x minus 2 with respect to dt. And limits of integration are from 6 to f of x. Okay, please give it a try and type in your response once you're done.
Once done, please feel free to type in. Four point five. Okay. Shreya also says she got the same. Well, good. Anybody else who wants to respond? Ardhra, Rashmi, Paras. Okay, guys. Let's evaluate this. So basically, see here, uh, you are integrating with respect to t, right? So x is just like a constant. Okay. So this entire expression, you could actually write it like this: limit x tending to two. Okay. Uh, integration of four t cube dt from six to f of x, and you can treat as if you're dividing the whole thing by x minus two. Correct. Okay, because x minus two has no role to play because you are integrating with respect to t. Correct. Now, if you see this carefully, it is actually a zero by zero form of indeterminacy. Why zero by zero form? Denominator is definitely zero because the moment you put x s two, two minus two becomes zero. Whereas numerator also becomes zero. How do I know that? Simple. If you put two in place of x, it becomes integral from six to f of two. And f of two is already known to me as six, right? So it is as good as integrating from six to six. Correct. So anything integrated from the same point to same point will give you a zero result, right? That's why I'm so sure that it's a zero by zero form. So if it is a zero by zero form, we can actually apply the L'Hopital's rule, right? Yes or no? Okay. So if you apply L'Hopital rule, okay, just differentiate the numerator with respect to x. Correct. So you are differentiating the numerator with respect to x. So for that you need Leibniz rule. So basically you are doing this. Let me write it in a plain and simple words. d by dx of 6 to f of x 4t cube dt divided by 1 minus 0 okay so applying leibniz rule here it becomes 4 f of x whole cube into derivative of f of x and we don't have to put anything like 6 because ultimately derivative of 6 is going to be 0 Okay, so you can avoid writing anything else because it will be ultimately a 4 into 6 cube into 0. Okay, so this entire thing becomes a 0. So whenever there is a constant, you don't have to write that term because you are going to multiply with the derivative of a constant at the end, which is going to make everything 0, right? So ultimately, this is your answer because denominator, you have only one, right? Okay, now put the value of x as 2 because ultimately after applying Leibniz we have to put the value uh, uh, ultimately after applying the L'Hopital's rule we have to put the value of x as a so it becomes 4 f of 2 whole cube into f dash 2 correct now f of 2 is 6 so that's going to be 6 cube and f dash 2 is going to be 1 by 18 if I'm not wrong. Let me just drag up and check. Oh yeah, 1 by 48, I'm sorry, 1 by 48. Okay, so this goes by a factor of 12. In fact, uh, this is 36 into 6 by 12. So this goes and ultimately your answer is 18, not 4.5. Okay, so all you girls who got the same answer, you were all wrong. And you realize where you went wrong? 
I'm sure it must be some silly mistake here and there, but all of you doing the same mistake is quite surprising. What happened, Shreya? Okay. So, 18 is the answer. That smiley is for all of you. Okay. Let's have another question. If integral of cos of t square, if integral of cos of t square with respect to t is same as integral of sine t by t from 0 to x square, then prove that, then prove that dy by dx is twice of sine x square by x cos y square. No, why should it be f of x minus 2? Why are you changing your x to f of x? Let x be x. Yeah, exactly. You you forgot to differentiate the denominator. That's correct, Shreya. Never mind, Anthony. Let's let's try out this problem. This is pretty straightforward problem. Okay, again, I'm giving you a hint. Differentiate both sides with respect to x, x, okay? Just type done once you're done. Done. Great. Let's discuss it. So what I'm doing is I'm differentiating both sides with respect to x. Okay. So this side will become cos of y square cos of y square into derivative of y square with respect to x, which we know is dy by dx. And as the lower limit of integration is a constant, which is zero in this case, you don't have to bother writing the second term also, right? So guys, don't waste time writing the second term because you know you're having a derivative of a constant at the end. Well, this will be sine of x square by x square into derivative of x square, which is 2x. And again, I will not bother to write the next term, right? 
well this is the end of the game so xx gets cancelled get this cos y square in the denominator so this becomes 2 sin x square by cos of in fact there's one x left over here x cos of y square done and it's proved okay simple okay let's take another one guys i want to do a lot of question on this because you know this concept is not there in your cbsc and secondly j uh, likes this concept a lot okay and this is the most challenging of all the properties i would not say difficult but yes most challenging of all the properties <coughs> okay next question is if x is equal to integral of okay if x is equal to integral of 1 by under root 1 plus 90 square from 0 to y and d2y by dx square is a y d2y by dx square is a y question is find the value of a find the value of a a is a constant okay so here a is a constant a belongs to a constant try this out type in your response in the chat box once you're done Okay, Shia says nine. I would not say right or wrong as of now. Let let's uh, see what others have to say. nine absolutely okay correct nine is the right answer okay okay so again we have we have to apply Leibniz rule here so let's differentiate with respect to um, y this time okay so let's find dx by dy so dx by dy is going to be uh, one by under root of one plus nine y square okay into derivative of y with respect to y which is one and I would not even bother to write the next term because that, that contains the derivative of a zero, so which is going to be zero. So this implies uh, dy by dx is nothing but under root of one plus nine y square, right? Now d2y by dx square means what? d2y by dx square means you have to differentiate dy by dx again with respect to x, okay? So we can all do that because uh, it's a simple cakewalk for everyone here. So that's going to be 1 by 2 under root of 1 plus 9y square into derivative of 9y square with respect to x, which is 18y dy by dx. Right? So uh, simplifying this further, it becomes 9y into dy by dx. dy by dx is your 1 plus 9y square. As you can see here, dy by dx is already under root 1 plus 9y square. So this and this gets cancelled, giving you the answer as 9y. And if you compare this with a y, your a is nothing but 9. Absolutely correct, guys. 
okay hope you are finding uh, this concept more familiar and uh, now i'm going to take up a problem <coughs> which is slightly more challenging let's say i have a function defined from the interval 0 to infinity to 0 to infinity so this is the domain and codomain of the function okay and this is a differentiable function okay so this is a derivable function okay and this function satisfies a functional equation which goes like this okay it says x times integral 0 to x 1 minus t f of t dt is equal to 0 to x t f of t dt okay for all x belonging to the interval 0 to infinity okay it's also given that f of 1 is 1 it's also given that f of 1 is 1 okay okay question is find the function find the function what is the function you have to state all right hope the question is clear so we are dealing with the function which is a derivable function and the function is defined from 0 to infinity uh, to 0 to infinity and it satisfies a relation x into integral of 1 minus t f t dt from 0 to x is equal to integral of t f t from 0 to x and we know f of 1 is 1 we have to find what is my function in this case what is the function in this case I know you can, will not be able to type the function, so you can just uh, unmute yourself and uh, you know speak out the function to me.
if you feel you have no idea how to uh, proceed with this you can also type that so that i know that uh, nobody is everybody has given up and i have to start solving this but if you're trying well and good keep trying All right, so I think enough time has been given. Let's let's try to uh, look into the solution for this. See, uh, the first thing is I will differentiate both sides with respect to x. Okay, so since I have no clue about the function, that's the only resort that is left to differentiate both sides with respect to x. Now, please mark here that there are two functions multiplied over here. Okay, so x into this. So I'll be applying product rule while I'm using the derivative on the left hand side. So first, let me differentiate x. So that's one, and there's other things I'll copy as such. So zero to x, one minus t f of t dt. Okay. Next is I'll keep this x as such, and then I'll differentiate this by use of the Leibniz rule. So that's going to be one minus x f of x into derivative of x. That's going to be one. And don't even bother writing the next term because that's going to be zero anyhow. Right hand side will be x into f of x. Okay, so far so good. Nobody has any problem in this. Let's try to bring this term to the right hand side and let's try to group up f of x together. So 0 to x, 1 minus t f of t dt is going to be, uh, let's take x f of x common. So that's going to be 1 minus 1 minus x. Uh, that's going to be x square f of f, f of x x square f of x Okay, so finally you see let me change the ink uh, Finally, you see you are left with this expression 1 minus t f of t dt This is equal to x square f of x Okay Now again apply Leibniz rule. Let's apply Leibniz rule again Okay so it will become 1 minus x f of x here i will write x square f dash x plus 2x f of x plus 2x f of x correct so let's bring again terms having uh, f of x together so 1 minus 3 f of 3x f of x is equal to x square f dash x okay now let's do one very interesting thing over here let us bring f of x and f dash x to one side put a dx and integrate both sides okay this is a critical step over here because most of the people would not be uh, anticipating this step to come up so now when you do that the left hand side is just uh, integration of 1 by x square minus 3 by x Whereas the right hand side, you know that if you take f of x as t, I'm sorry, f of x as t, f dash x dx is going to become a dt. That means it is just like integrating uh, dt by t, isn't it? So finally, the result will be minus 1 by x minus 3 ln x 
and this is going to be ln mod t mod t is nothing but your function itself so i'm putting the function back and of course don't forget the constant of integration guys just a word of advice from my side to all of you whenever you are performing an indefinite integral never ever forget the constant of integration okay you may feel that it's a unnecessary thing but remember you will not be able to get a correct answer if you are not using that right good now i don't need a mod here because if you see the function definition is from 0 to infinity to 0 to infinity that means the function is already attaining positive values so it is only defined for positive values so mod is redundant so can i remove this mod from here let's drop this mod i don't need this mod okay because f of x is already positive right because f of x is already positive okay now how do i get this c to get this c you can see that we have been provided this condition f of 1 is 1 okay this is going to help us to get the value of c so what i am going to do is i am going to put x as 1 everywhere and my f of x is going to be 1 okay so this gives you the value of c as mind you ln1 ln1 becomes 0 so c is actually negative 1 as you can see this there is a you know a uh, value of c that we are getting so had you not, had you ignored it you would have you no know, got a wrong result right so ultimately your function is let me rewrite this function here so ultimately your function is minus 1 by x minus 3 ln x is equal to ln of f of x ln of f of x minus 1 that means ln of f of x is nothing but 1 minus x minus 3 ln x let me bring the ln's together so ln f of x plus 3 ln x is equal to 1 minus 1 by x and we all know that this is going to be okay uh this is this is going to be f of x into x cube correct isn't it because 3 ln x is nothing but ln of x cube and ln a plus ln b is ln ab so i have skipped a step in between but hope you are able to understand this if not please let me know so i can say f of x into x cube is take nt log so it will become e to the power 1 minus oh why did i write an x cube here i'm sorry that's an x yeah so it's going to be e to the power 1 minus 1 by x so ultimately your f of x is just divide by x cube so 1 by x cube e to the power 1 minus 1 by x okay so this becomes your function is that fine are you able to connect now i would say this problem to be a j advanced problem it is not a j main problem it is higher than the j main level okay so please type clr on your screen if this is clear awesome great 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 okay oh aditya is also here now i'll take an example where you have the generalization of the leibniz rule been used so if y is equal to integral of f of t sin kx minus kt now see here this is this, in this case they have they have given a x also in the function so it's a multivariate function okay then prove that then prove that d2y by dx square plus k square y is equal to k times f of x
Hint is you have to use the generalized form of the Leibniz rule. Once you're done, please type down on your screen, on your chat box. Great, Shia is done. Let's wait for one more person to uh, finish, then we can discuss this. <clears throat> Okay, let's discuss this. So first, we'll apply this uh, formula of Leibniz rule. I'm writing it down for the benefit of all of you. The formula is Remember here, you are integrating with respect to T while you're differentiating with respect to X. And this function contains both the variables. Okay. So this is going to be integral from phi x to psi x of the partial derivative with respect to x of the function f of x comma t. Okay. Plus f of x comma psi x minus sorry f psi dash x minus f of x comma phi dash uh, phi x into phi dash x into phi dash x so this is the most generalized form of the Leibniz rule the proof the proof of this was already sent in the morning to you so please have a look at it after today's class so now 
this is my multivariate function because it has t also in it and it has x also in it right so first is we have to do a partial derivative of this function with respect to x remember when you're doing partial derivative with respect to x t must be treated as a constant okay so f of t will also be a constant correct and the derivative of co, uh, sine is cos kx minus kt into the derivative of kx minus kt which is k okay let's see what are the other terms plus now you put your x in place of t and differentiate with respect to uh, differentiate x which is going to be zero anyways correct and then you have to put a zero and differentiate with a zero that is also going to be zero anyway so i'm not going to write both the terms both these two terms will actually be zero each is that fine why the first term is zero because your this function will become a zero because when you put t as x kx minus kx will be zero and sin zero we all know is zero why why does this term become a zero because you are ultimately having a constant over here whose derivative is anyway zero right is this fine no problem in finding dy by dx so this is your dy by dx so far let us apply leibniz once more so let us differentiate both sides with respect to x once more so again the same thing this is my new function so phi x to psi x partial derivative of this will be k f of t this will become minus sin kx minus kt into a k so k square will come over here right plus put the upper limit in fact my upper limit here is x so let me just write x and 0 x and 0 so upper limit is x that is going to make this function k f of x k kx minus kx into 1 and the other term i don't even have to write because that is going to be zero anyhow okay so this is going to give me d2y by dx square minus k square 0 to x f of t sin kx minus kt this will become k f of x remember cos of 0 is going to be 1 anyhow and this term if you recognize this term is actually your y itself so this is nothing but minus k square y plus k f of x bringing it to the other side we end up getting d2y by dx square plus k square y is equal to k f of x okay hence proved is that fine any questions so leibniz was applied twice and probably this is the first example where i gave you um a instance where you had a multivariate function appearing in the question okay now in all these questions we pretty much have an idea that okay leibniz rule is going to be used but let us take a question like this which will probably surprise you evaluate integral from 0 to 1 x to the power b minus 1 by ln x okay solve this question it's a pretty simple question so basically b is a quantity here which is greater than equal to 0 so i have given integration for integration of x to the power b minus 1 by ln x from 0 to 1 
Any idea? Any idea how to do it? Please type no idea if you don't have any idea how to proceed. So that I know how many of you are just sitting idle. Great, everybody is trying. Good. Sure, I'll give you two minutes. Try it out. Let's see whether you're able to make some progress. B, ah, uh, no, B is not the right answer. Okay, so let, let me just solve this first. Guys, uh, by looking at this problem, uh, you would have realized by this time that your answer would be in terms of B only, right? Correct? So let this be your function of B. Okay. You can write IB or let me make it as a function only so that you can relate to it. So your answer would be a function of B only, right? Everybody agrees to this. Everybody agrees to the fact that when you integrate this, of course, you don't know the value of B yet. You can only substitute for X. So everything will be in terms of B. So this answer would be a function of B. Correct. So now let us differentiate both sides with respect to B. Okay. Now it is pretty surprising. Why? Because b here as you assume to be a constant it is actually a parameter because as your b changes you will have your answer according to the b value there isn't it 
So it surprises a lot of students when they listen to this expression that, oh, you're differentiating with respect to a constant. No, it is not actually a constant. It's a parameter. For a different, different B, for a different, different uh, question, B will be different. Okay. Now, if you differentiate this with respect to B, remember X would be playing the role of your T now. Are you getting it? So this has to be treated as a function of B and X. Correct. So you have been given something like this. You have been given integral of B F of X, which you are integrating with respect to X, but differentiating with respect to B. Are you getting this point? So there is a role change now. You're not differentiating with respect to X. You're differentiating with respect to B. But you are integrating with respect to X. So what role T played earlier? Now X is playing that role. And what role X played earlier? B is playing that role. Are you getting this point? This is very critical. Understood. Please type clear if it is clear to you what I'm trying to say. Correct. Okay. So now when I apply my Leibniz rule, I have to do partial derivative with respect to B of this expression. Okay. And other terms will not appear because both the numerator and denominator are like constants. So these two terms would be 0 minus 0. So there's no point writing them out. Okay. Now, what is the derivative of this term with respect to B? Remember, X is a constant. So when X is a constant, it is just like 1 by ln X is just a constant for you. And derivative of this term is like constant to a power of a variable. Constant to the power of a variable will be nothing but this, right? It's just like saying, what is the derivative of A to the power X? A to the power X derivative is A to the power X ln A. So here your x is your constant, b is your variable. So it is constant to the power variable ln constant. Yes or no? Now cancel this out. It just boils down into integration of x to the power b, which is nothing but x to the power b plus 1 by b plus 1 according to your power rule of integration. Put your limits, it becomes 1 by b plus 1. Correct? Now the problem is not over yet. You have found out f dash b my dear friends. Getting my point. We need to know f of b. So for f of b you would say hey it's a simple I can just integrate this with respect to b. Okay. Which is nothing but ln of b plus 1. Okay. Now I'm writing b plus 1 because I know b is positive. Okay. I don't need to put a mod around it. But remember to put a constant of integration. Many of you would forget this constant of integration, which is going to cost you dearly. Okay, so don't forget that constant of integration. Fine. Now, how do I find that constant of integration? That's the next question. Now, if you can see the question very clearly here, you would realize that f of zero will be zero. Why? I, I, I'm making a claim here that f of zero would be zero. Why? It's obvious because it will be now integration of 0 to 1 x to the power 0 minus 1 by ln x. And x to the power 0 is 1 itself. So it's going to be 1 minus 1 on the numerator. Okay. So this is going to help me find the value of c. Now let's use the fact that f0 is 0. It implies f0 is equal to ln 0 plus 1 plus c. This is 0, ln 1 is also 0, so c is also 0. So here if by mistake also, if you would have forgotten c, you were safe actually. <laughs> but don't expect that to happen every time. So here we are. This is my answer. Right? This question, let me tell you, surprises a lot of students because this is the first time they realize the importance of and the strength of Leibniz rule. Any question with respect to this? Please type no Q if there's no question.
Okay. At least everybody is attentive, listening to this. Great. Let's talk about the next question. I know you would be more inquisitive to solve questions of the similar type. So let's move on and do one more. In fact, two more we'll do today. So 0 to pi by 2. Okay, find the value of this integral. Uh, I'll give you the options. Options are option A, which is pi times under root of ln x minus 1. Option B, pi times under root of 1 plus x minus 2. Pi times, sorry, under root of pi times under root of x. Uh, under root of 1 plus x, I'm sorry, minus 1, and option D is nota. Remember, you are integrating with respect to theta, okay? So your answer would be in terms of x. Just type the option number which you feel is correct.
Okay, let's discuss this. So we all know that this is going to be a function of x, right? Because x is just like a constant and you are integrating with respect to theta. So ultimately you'll substitute the upper and the lower limit on theta, right? So now let us differentiate both sides with respect to x. Okay, so according to the Leibniz rule, this will be partial derivative with respect to x of log 1 plus x sine square theta by sine square theta d theta okay and we don't have to put the terms after this because you know your upper and the lower limit both are constants so the derivative of constants are going to disappear okay so partial derivative of this means you are treating uh, uh, theta to be constant and only x is treated as a variable so this will be 1 by 1 plus x sine square theta into okay derivative of this is going to be 0 plus 1 sine square theta so sine square theta sine square theta will be gone so 0 to pi by 2 d theta so ultimately it boils down to integrating 0 to pi by 2 okay 1 by 1 plus x sine square theta with respect to theta okay right now how do i integrate this how do i integrate this okay there are a lot of ways uh, i can divide the numerator and denominator by cos square theta so 0 to pi by 2 so let's divide the numerator with cos square so it will give me secant square theta d theta this will again give you a secant square theta and this will give you a x tan square theta. Okay. So this gives you integration from 0 to pi by 2 secant square theta d theta. And this is going to be 1 plus x plus 1 tan square theta. Correct. Right. Let's take tan theta is t now. So secant square theta d theta will be equal to dt. So this will become integral from 0 to infinity dt by 1 plus x plus 1 t square. Guys, remember here x will behave just like a constant because integration is happening with respect to t. Right? So pull out of x plus 1 out. So it becomes 0 to infinity dt by 1 by uh, x plus 1 plus t square. You can write this as under root square. Okay, so we all know it's a square plus t square form, which is a standard integral. So that will give you 1 by a. 1 by a means under root of x plus 1. Tan inverse x by a. x by a will be this okay upper and the lower limits let's put it okay so this and this will get cancelled so it will be 1 by root x plus 1 when you put an infinity it becomes a pi by 2 when you put a 0 in place of t it becomes a 0 so ultimately you get this expression but remember this is f dash x only i have to find f of x this is my f dash x so f dash x is pi by 2 under root x plus 1. So to find f of x, it's pretty easy. We have to integrate with respect to x. Okay. Right. So what will this become? This will become pi by 2 uh, integration of x plus 1 to the power of negative half which is nothing but pi by 2 uh, x plus 1 to the power half okay divided by half so into 2 plus a c don't forget the c i'm telling you the c is very very important and many people will forget it so this will become pi you can write this as root of 1 plus x if you want plus a c now how do i get c how do i get c do you recall that f of 0 in this case if you put your theta as if you put your x as 0 okay your 
function will become integration of 0 to pi by 2 log 1 plus 0 because your x will be 0 here okay divided by sine square theta which ultimately will boil down to 0 itself because log of 1 is 0 so what we know from here that f of 0 is 0 this will help me to get the value of c here so let's go down here yeah so this is your f of x okay so let's put x as 0 okay so this will be 0 itself this will be pi plus c so c becomes minus of pi c becomes minus of pi so put it back put this back over here okay so ultimately let me write it down ultimately your answer is f of x is pi under root of 1 plus x minus pi take pi common so it's under root 1 plus x minus 1 let's see which option matches with this pi under root 1 plus x minus 1 oh option a is the right option option a matches with it is that fine guys so i'll, I'll just repeat the roadmap the roadmap is uh I know at the end of the day this integral would be a function of x okay then i differentiated both sides with respect to x by using of by using a leibniz rule once i integrate uh, differentiated once i got an integral which is right here with in front of you this is easy to evaluate this was easy to evaluate okay once you evaluate it i'm sure you know your indefinite concepts very well by this time so once you evaluate it you know the value of f dash x okay which is right over here so this is the stage we, we reached at then we integrated this once more to get f of x because ultimately that's what we are seeking for and to get the value of constant of integration at this at this step i use the uh, fact that f of zero is zero and i got that constant of integration and thereby completing my f of x which is the required integral is that fine does it make sense any doubt if it is clear please type clr on your screen next question is prove that
Any idea how to do this? Okay, I'll just give you a hint. Uh, I think we had, in fact, let me ask this as a question to you. How would you integrate this? Forget about this square. Without this square, how would you integrate this? So you would say pretty simple. Uh, you divide by cos square, just like the way we did the previous question. So if you divide by uh, cos square, it becomes uh, secant square x dx by a square tan square x plus b square. Okay. Then of course you would uh, take your tan x to be t. So secant square x dx will be your dt. So this would be from zero to infinity dt by a square t square plus b square which is nothing but uh, you can treat this as 0 to infinity uh, b square plus a t the whole square okay so something like the form of the special integral a square plus x square right we know its result is 1 by a tan inverse x by so this will be Similarly, 1 by b tan inverse a t by b divided by a. So this will become a b. Okay. Now put the limits of integration 0 to pi by 2. So the moment you put a pi by 2, I'm sorry, 0 to infinity, not pi by 2. Pi by 2 is already gone. We have to put 0 to infinity. So when you put infinity, it'll be, you'll get pi by 2. When you put a 0, you'll get a 0. So the result is pi by 2 a b. Now you must be wondering why am I doing this, right? What it has to do with this question, okay? My question was this, why did I sit and evaluate this, okay? Now there's something very interesting which I'll show you right now. So I can actually get this result by differentiation, right? Differentiation. So I'm going to show you that next. Now that I know that integration from 0 to pi by 2 dx by a square sine square x plus b square cos square x is pi by 2 ab okay let us differentiate both sides with respect to a okay let's differentiate both sides with respect to a Okay, of course, we'll be using Leibniz rule here. I'm treating my b x everything to be like another variable and a is my uh, you know, variable of integration. Uh, sorry, variable of differentiation. So I'm differentiating with respect to a here. Please make a note. Right. So as per Leibniz rule, this will be 0 to pi by 2 partial derivative of this with respect to a. What will be the partial derivative of this with respect to a? So we'll say 1 by Please note sin x, b, cos x, etc. All b will be like a constant. So minus this square into derivative of this term, which will be 2a sin square x. Okay. Are you getting this point? Okay. Other terms will not appear. And I have to differentiate this side also with respect to a. So that will be minus 5 by 2 a square b. Is that clear? Is that clear? Okay. So I'll drop the minus 2 a terms from both the sides. So this I can write it as 0 to pi by 2 sine square x dx by a square sine square x b square cos square x square and drop a minus 2a term so that will become pi by 4 a cube b pi by 4 a cube b
Is that fine? Yes, sir. Oh, somebody spoke. <laughs> okay. Okay. In a similar way, if I differentiate both sides with respect to B, okay, let, let's go back to the original uh, expression 0 to pi by 2 dx by uh, a square sine square x plus b square cos square x. And let us differentiate this both sides with respect to B. So in that case, what will I get? I will get minus 1 by a square sine square x plus b square cos square x whole square into derivative of this will be 2b cos square x. And this side I'll get minus 2 by a b square. Is that fine? Now drop the factor of minus 2b both sides. So it will become 0 to pi by 2. Uh, why I'm writing cos b. I'm sorry. Yeah, cos x. Okay. So it will become cos square x dx by a square sine square x plus b square cos square x whole square. And on the right hand side, I'll have uh, 4 by pi a b cube. Right. Now let us add 1 and 2. Let's call this result as 1 and 2 and let's add them. Let's add 1 and 2. Any question? Okay, let's add 1 and 2. So when you add 1 and 2, it becomes 0 to pi by 2. Uh, numerate, since denominator is same, you can just simply add up numerator on the left hand side. So denominator for both the terms is this. So you'll have sine square plus cos square. And on this side, you'll have pi by 4 a cube b and pi by 4 a b cube. Right? So let us take the LCM of pi a cube b cube. So you'll get pi b square here and pi a square over here, which is nothing but pi a square plus b square by 4 a cube b cube. This is my answer. Is this what we wanted to show? Is this what we, what we want to show? Yes, absolutely. This is what we wanted to show. Correct. Is that fine? Again, see yes, the sure. beauty of using derivatives with an integral sign. Okay. And how efficiently you can solve this problem, you know, without having to go into the nitty gritties of complicated substitutions or by using you know, kind of product rule, etc. Is that fine? Okay. Yes, sir. So now we'll move on to uh, the inequality properties. So now we are jumping on to uh, some other properties, the inequality properties. Okay. So let's take up the inequality properties of definite integral. Okay. First property, which is a very obvious and trivial one. Okay. So let's say we have two functions f, g and h. Okay. And these functions are okay, defined and continuous in the interval a to b. Okay. So they are defined and continuous in the interval a to b. And these three functions are related by this relation that is g of x is lesser than f of x and f of x is less than equal to h of x. Okay. Now the similar property will also hold on their integrals as well. That means if you integrate 
g of x from a to b this will be lesser than integral of f of x from a to b and this will be lesser than equal to integral of h of x from a to b are you getting this point now the proof of this is pretty simple i mean uh, you can just look at the you know geometrical proof for this rather than anything else so you know your g of x h of x is on the top let's say this is your h of x then is your uh, f of x and then let's say there is your g of x okay f of x and this is a g of x okay and you're trying to integrate from x equal to a till x equal to b okay as you can clearly see that the area within uh, the area below h of x will be higher than the area between f of x and that will in turn be higher than the area between g of x correct so you can say uh, let me name this figure as a uh, b c d e f so the area of the area of uh, let me name this triangle uh, uh, let me name this uh, curvilinear structure as a c d b that would be higher in fact let me start from the low order a a f b would be lesser than equal to area of a b e b and this in turn will be lesser than the area of a c d b okay and they they represent nothing but the respective integral so this is integral of f of x sorry g of x this is the integral of g of x and this is the integral of f of x and this is the integral of h of x is that fine well what kind of problems can i get on this now the, sometimes the problems on this becomes very dicey i mean you have to apply your trial and error method and okay uh, and it becomes irritating at times okay for example uh, let's take this question prove that <coughs> sorry prove that integral of <coughs> lies between 0 and 1 by 8 okay so many times we need to uh, you know react to this as per our you know requirement of the options also okay uh, here your x is lying between 0 and 1 let's say i don't need to give that because the limit of the constant of integration uh, the sorry the upper and the lower limits of integration already say so so this information may not be given to you because we all know we are integrating from 0 to 1 so your x has to be between 0 to 1 now let let me solve this question because you'll get an idea of course when you are between 0 to 1 all these terms are positive right correct so this function itself is a positive function so i can say this will be greater than 0 correct now when x is between 0 to 1 okay you would all appreciate that x to the power 7 will also be between 0 to 1 okay uh, sorry why i am writing x to the power 7 x to the power 8 because we have x to the power 8 in the denominator correct so 1 plus x to the power 8 will lie between 1 to 2 correct so root of 1 plus x to the power 8 will be greater than 1 and less than root 2 correct okay so can i say this quantity if you reciprocate it can i say x to the power 7 by under root of 1 plus x to the power 8 since this quantity is greater than 1 this entire quantity will be less than x to the power 7 Yes or no? Because if you're dividing any quantity by a number which is greater than one, the resultant value would be lesser than the numerator quantity. 
so this function is bounded between this basically what i did i, I did a kind of reverse engineering when i saw zero zero came into my mind and when i saw one by eight basically what came in my mind was integration of x to the power seven from zero to one this will also give you one by eight yes or no and hence the result that if you integrate both sides from zero to one okay so your desired expression will now appear over here so this term this term would lie between one zero to one by eight and hence root so here because the question was given to you to prove it you could you know think of it but many a times uh, you have to look at the options to see what they are actually asking you are you getting my point so it requires a bit of practice let's let's take one more uh, let's take this question prove that integration from 0 to half this lies between half to pi by 6 for n greater than or equal to 1 Think about it. Just try to figure out how would you get that half and how would you get that uh, pi by 6 and reason it out. If done, please type done.
or i say let's see here you are dealing from zero to half means you are dealing with fractions correct so any fraction which is between zero and half if you square it correct right it will be a value which is lesser than x so this guy will be lesser than x right <coughs> yes or no okay and if you raise to a higher power still which is greater than 1 can i say this will be lesser than this isn't it so ultimately <coughs> what i'm trying to say is if you raise a fraction to a power greater than 1 the resultant quantity will still become lesser and lesser right if you put a negative sign in front of it the inequality will switch right put a 1 that will not affect the inequality put a under root that will not affect the inequality because both are positive quantities okay can i say this quantity will be less than this quantity and this in turn will be less than 1 for sure right okay yes or no of course when it becomes zero it will become equal so we can put equality also here now let us reciprocate this if you reciprocate this it will become ulta so this guy will come over here one will come over here okay I'm I'm sorry. The inequality sign are I've also changed the inequality sign. That will remain the same. This will be greater than. This will be greater. Than. Okay. Yes or no? Now treat this as if this is your f of x. This is your you know whatever is your g of x. This is your h of x. Okay. So even the integration will also follow the same inequality sign. That means integration of this will always be greater than equal to integration of this. will always be greater than integration of 1 okay from 0 to half 0 to half 0 to half right this is very simple to integrate this is sin inverse x 0 to half this is something which i don't need to bother because this is asked in the question the range of this interval and this is nothing but integration of x from 0 to half so that gives you pi by 6 greater than integration of this from 0 to half okay and i think this is the same thing that has been asked in the question and i have just written the inequality sign slightly opposite so ultimately the result is the same you can just flip the order in which you have written so half is less than equal to integration from 0 to half dx by under root 1 minus x to the power 2n less than equal to pi by 6 is that clear guys how it works any question so far no doubt sir no doubt okay great okay then let's have this question we have an integral i1 which is integration of sin x by x from pi by 6 to pi by 3 and this is another integration from pi by 6 to pi by 3 which is sin of sin x by sin x okay and we have another integration i3 which is sin of tan x by tan x sin of tan x by tan x then which of the following options is correct then select the correct option option a i1 will be greater than i2 will be greater than i3 option b i2 will be greater than i1 and this will be greater than i3 option c 
I3 will be greater than I2 will be greater than I1. Option D, I3 will be greater than I1 will be greater than I2. So Shreya says option A, okay. So is it option B? Aditya says B, okay. What about others? Okay, let's discuss this guys. See, if you see this, the structure actually looks like sine t by t kind of a structure right where first your t is x here it is x sine x and here it is tan x correct okay now this function uh, i'm sure most of you would have seen this function you know when you are doing limits chapter it's like a wave okay kind of a thing okay so in the interval 0 to pi this function is a decreasing function uh, I'll better show you on uh, GeoGebra also how it works. Hope you can see my screen here. So y is equal to uh, sine x by x. Okay, as you can see here on your screen, it's a kind of a ripple. Okay, and let's have a x equal to pi also. So from zero to pi, you can see this function is decreasing. Okay, this function is falling down as you can see here. Correct. So it is showing a decreasing characteristic. Yes or no? Do you agree with me? It's yes, showing sir. a decreasing characteristic. If it is showing a decreasing characteristic, then can I say that if you put a higher value of the function, 
if you put the higher value of x uh, sorry t the function is going to be lesser okay because when a function is a decreasing function for a uh, for a higher value the function is going to fall down more correct so can i say sign of can i say this function what i'm doing yeah this function if i put input of x sin x x and tan x we all know that they are related to each other by this sin x is always lesser than x and x is always lesser than tan x so when you're putting this in in the function in place of t that is sine of sin x by sin x sine of x by x and sine of tan x by x can i say oh my bad i should not put this yeah now you tell me how the inequality will be placed over here for the most heavier one the value will be the least correct and the most lesser one the value would be the greatest so this is how this function would be related to each other and so would be their integrals correct <clears throat> so if i integrate this from pi by 6 to pi by 3 this also from pi by 6 to pi by 3 this also from pi by 6 to pi by 3 okay this is how this integrals would be related by the way this is i2 this is i1 and this is i3 so i2 would be greater than i1 i1 would be greater than i3 so option number b aditya was absolutely correct is that clear please type clr if it is clear clear sir everybody else clear awesome great moving on to the next property in inequality property number 2 okay if there is a function f of x okay <clears throat> defined in the interval a to b and this function f of x has a global maxima of let's say capital m and a global minima of a small m in this interval a to b then the property says integral of f of x actually will lie between m b minus a to capital m b minus a can you prove this done very simple so just now we learned that when f of x lies between g of x and h of x so will their integrals also correct so will their integrals also correct now apply the same concept over here since you know that small m is your global minima your function will always be greater than your global minima and always be less than your global maxima correct here actually your g and h roles are been played by small m and small and capital m respectively right so if you apply the property same property here i can say integral of f of x from a to b will be also be applied to this correct 
and these are constants right so you just have mx and you put the limits of integration from a to b okay so this gives you answer as mb minus a is less than equal to integral of f of x from a to b okay plain and simple graphically also let us try to understand this see let us say your function has something like this characteristic okay so let's say here okay so this is your starting point a and this is your ending point b okay so this is your global maxima of this function and this is the global minima of this function okay so what does this uh, situation say is situation is uh, saying that if you make a rectangle like this this rectangle will always have a higher area than the area within the yellow graph and if you make a rectangle like this let me change my pen color to blue if you make a rectangle like this this area will always be blue area and let me do it as white area and let me make a yellow area also okay so what is trying to say is that the white area will be greater than the yellow area and the yellow area will be greater than the blue area this is what this inequality tries to suggest okay let us take questions on this property what type of questions are asked on this i'll just take one one question prove that this integral Five minus x by nine minus x square dx from zero to two lies between one and six by five. <laughs> Once done, please type done on your chat box. Yes, sir. Done. Done. How about others? Ardhira, Rashmi, Samyukta, Hamsini. okay all you need to do is figure out the maximum global maximum and global minimum of this function in the interval 0 to 2 so if you see this function let's try to figure out 
where does the global maxima and the minima of this function lie? For that, we need to put the derivative of the function as zero. Okay, and see what roots come out from this. So uh, if you differentiate this, you, you will be getting nine minus x square into negative one minus five minus x into negative two x by nine minus x square whole square equal to zero. Okay, let's let's simplify this. So we'll get uh, x square minus 9 plus uh, uh, you will have plus 10x, okay? And you'll have minus 2x square, okay? So equal to 0. So this gives you minus x square uh, plus 10x minus 9 equal to 0. I'm sure this is factorizable, right? 9x minus 1 and x minus 9. So 9 is beyond our uh, this thing, uh, interval 0 to 2. So I'll be only worried about 1. Okay, so 1 is the critical point. 1 is a uh, stationary point. So what I'll do, we all know how to find out global maxima and global minima, right? What we do is we individually put the values like 0, 1, and 2. Because this is my interval, right? My interval is from 0 to 2. Okay. And see manually which of them gives you the maximum value and which of them gives me the minimum value. Okay, so 0 gives me 5 by 9, undoubtedly. 1 gives you uh, 4 by 8, which is half. Correct. And 2 will give you 3 by, uh, 3 by 5. Yes or no? Correct. So which is yes, the sir. maximum? Which is the maximum of them? I think this is the max and this is the min. So this function lies between yes, half and 3 by 5. Okay, so I'm not writing the function here. So what I can say is that the integral of this function should lie between okay, half 2 minus 0 and 3 by 5 2 minus 0 which is nothing but it should lie between 1 and 6 by 5 okay is that fine so whenever inequality relations have been asked, please be aware of this property as well. It is not always necessary that you have to find two bounding functions like we did in the previous examples. Okay. Sometimes they can ask you a pretty simple straightforward one where you have to just figure out the global maxima and the global minima of that function in that given interval of integration. Okay. And then apply this property. So it becomes dicey because people ask me, sir, how would I know? Because, you know, whether we have to find two bounding functions or whether we have to do it global maxima and global minima property. See, the idea is only to try an error. There is like no straightforward. That's why these type of questions become uh, most unpredictable ones. Okay, try this out. Uh, prove that. By the way, let me tell you under root of 3 plus x cube cannot be integrated. I mean, it cannot be expressed as a integrable function. Okay, you cannot integrate under root 1 plus x cube type of function. This cannot be integrated. Cannot be integrated means it, you cannot express it. You cannot express the answer of that. It's inexpressible integral.
Guys, uh, many of your parents have complained that you are not serious during an online session. Guys, this is unacceptable at least at this stage of your career. When there's just three to four months left to write the most important exam of your life. If you're not serious, uh, you know, at this stage, nobody can make you serious at this time. Okay, whether it's an online offline, it's a matter of getting into a good college with a good branch that is going to decide your future prospects in your life. So nobody should tell you to be serious at this time. You should be self driven, right? It's very uh, saddening and disheartening to uh, you know listen from the parents that don't keep online sessions. My, my child is not serious in that. At least for a 12th grader, this is not acceptable. I can understand an 11th grader who takes a little, little bit more time to become serious. Once he starts realizing that things are going beyond his head now. But right now, just three, four months are left. And moreover, uh, the problem solving sessions are only uh, taken online because we don't have to write the questions. We can just project the question and discuss about it. Okay. So going forward, I should not hear these complaints that you are not serious in an online session because you are, if you are not serious, you know, you are being dishonest with yourself. You are harming yourself, nobody else. Right? You are here to learn. And if you are, Person who is keen to learn, you should be very, very attentive and serious during any type of session, whether it's online or offline. Offline, you guys are definitely, I've seen you guys, you're, you're very disciplined, you're, you take uh, notes very seriously, take the class very seriously, but online also, you should show the same behavior. You're not studying for, uh, you know, your parents, you're not studying for me, you're studying for yourself. Yeah, any idea how to do this? I mean, just, just go from that global maxima, global minima perspective. See, if you see this term f of x is equal to under root of 3 plus x cube. Okay. If you differentiate this, you get 1 by 2 under root 3 plus x cube into 3x square. Okay. Now, this will always be positive for sure. That means this function, if your f dash x is positive, what does it imply? What does it comment about the nature of the function? That means your f of x is always an increasing function. Correct. If it is an increasing function, its minimum value will be obtained at the initial point, which is one. So minimum value will be G1, uh, sorry, F1, right? F1 will be what? Under root of three plus one cube, which is nothing but two. What is G max? G max is going to be the last point, F3, which is nothing but three plus three cube. And that's how that root 30 makes its appearance, correct? So since this function lies between since this function lies between 2 and root 30. So we can say by the property which we just now discussed that the integral of this function from 1 to 3 will lie between 2 into 3 minus 1 and root, root 30 into 3 minus 1. That's nothing but 4 4 to 2 root 30. 4 to 2 root 30. Getting the point? Yes. Yeah, sir. Is that awesome. Great. So we'll now uh, make a move to the next inequality properties. <clears throat> this property says. Uh, I think this is the third one in the line. Yeah, this property says integral of a function from A to B, if you take the mod of it, this value will always be lesser than the value that you get when you integrate the mod of the given function. Okay. Geometrically speaking, it is very obvious, right? Let's say I have a function, right, which is like this. 
um, let's say like this okay and you're integrating it from a to b let's say this is your b point okay now this area i'm just hypothetically assuming that this area is 5 and this area is 3 correct so if you do integration from a to b f of x dx what answer do you expect you expect to get 5 minus 3 that is 2 as your answer correct okay and if you mod the function the very same function if you mod it you know its graph is going to be like this correct so you are integrating from a to b so this will be 5 and this will be 3 so if you integrate the mod of this function you are always going to get a positive answer that is 5 plus 3 which is 8 so this term this term will always be less than equal to this answer by the way may i know when will the equality hold true when will the equality hold true when the function is when it doesn't go to the negative part on the uh that's fine aditya it can be completely positive or it can be completely negative also that is also fine because you're ultimately modding your answer right so equality will hold true when the function is completely below the x-axis or above the x-axis not partially above and partially below a uh, mathematical way to prove it is very simple we all know that mod of anything will actually lie between negative of that quantity and that quantity itself correct yes or no at the same time i can also say this function will lie between the negative of its mod and this okay any function will always be greater than negative of its mod and the mod of of itself now this actually brings it, us to the property number one that we discussed so this is sandwiched between or this is bounded between these two functions right so integration of this from a to b will also be bounded between integration of mod of f of x and this function yes or no okay so it is the same way as if you are trying to say that mod of this quantity see it's like saying if x lies between minus a to a what does it mean mod x is less than a right treat the same situation over here also treat this as your minus a treat this as your x treat this as your a getting my point so in your mind let me write capital a capital x and capital a over here so that you can you don't get confused so treat this as your minus a treat this as your a treat this as your x so it is saying something like this capital x is lying between minus a to a so this is as good as saying mod x is less than a so mod of this quantity is your this expression this will be less than a a is your this expression and hence the property okay and hence the property fine what kind of questions can you get on this let's try to look into a question uh Let's take this question. The minimum odd value of A the minimum odd value of A a greater than 1 for which for which integral of 
साइन एक्स बाय वन प्लस एक्स टू दी पार ए डी एक्स फ्रॉम टेन टू नाइनटीन इज लेस देन वन बाय नाइन इज इक्वल टू ऑप्शंस आर वन थ्री फाइव नाइन the minimum odd value Any idea, anyone? Please type done once you are done. Okay, let's let's discuss this. See, sine x we know is less than x. Correct? Sine x is less than x. Okay. And sin x uh, is also less than one. Correct. So let's let's take that as okay. This is also less than one. Okay. Of course, we are talking about the interval ten to nineteen. Sin x is always less than one. Okay. So I can say this term will always be less than this term. Correct. Yes or no? And one by one plus x to the power a. As you can see, your x ranges from ten to nineteen, right? So if x lies between ten to nineteen, let me use square brackets. And you're talking about a being an odd value, odd natural number. Can I say this will be always be less than one plus ten to the power a? because the smaller this is the bigger is the value of the quantity because your denominator will be as less as possible right and this will always be greater than 1 by 1 plus 19 to the power a. are you getting my point so now see the chain of events this is less than this and this is less than this so can i say sin x by 1 plus x to the power a will be less than 1 by 1 plus 10 to the power a right correct and so will be the integration so if i integrate sin x by 1 plus x to the power a from 10 to 19 this should be less than integration of 1 by 1 plus x to the uh, 10 to the power a which is actually a constant altogether 
This entire thing is a constant. There is no x over it. Right? So if you evaluate it, if you evaluate it, it becomes is don't forget to write dx in your uh, this thing uh, answer script some teachers are very strict they'll deduct marks straight away c and dx people forget to write okay so this will be nothing but it's a constant times x correct so it will be this so far so uh, so good correct so this can be written as 19 minus 10 by 1 plus 10 to the power a 10 to the power a hope this looks like an a correct now can i say if this integral that we seek for should be less than 1 by 9 here you are saying this answer should be less than 1 by 9 can i say this this term should also be less than 1 by 9 that means you are trying to say that 9 by 1 plus 10 to the power a should be less than 1 by 9 that means 1 plus 10 to the power a should be greater than 81 correct that means 10 to the power a should be greater than 80 so which is the minimum a for which this will be greater than 80 so the minimum a cannot be 1 it cannot be it can be 3 so a has to be 3 in fact 2 only it will become but they are asking the odd number so a equal to 3 is your answer so option number b is correct so see the types of questions which they have started framing off late in j it is no longer a straightforward application of indefinite or the properties which you are learning right now they want you to think out of the box they want you to you know apply those concepts in a slightly different way let us move on to the last of these inequality properties. This property says that if f of x square and g of x square are integrable functions in the interval a to b, then, then mod of the product of f of x into g of x integral will be less than equal to under root of a to b a to b g square dx Okay, so what is trying to say is that mod of integral of the product here you are multiplying f of x into g of x and then integrating from a to b the mod of this answer will always be less than under root of the product of these two separate integrals that is integral of f square and g square both from a to b under root. Okay. So first I will prove this property. Sorry guys, I'm not going to give you any break today. We just have 15 minutes of class left. Uh, and I need to be a little bit faster also with respect to uh, completing this chapter because uh, some few more things are left off which I, I plan to take next class. Okay. No problem, sir. No problem, good. So uh, let us try to discuss this uh, proof. Let's say I have capital F of X as let's take this function as F of X minus some lambda G of X. Okay, where lambda is some real quantity squared. Let's say lambda is a real quantity. So I've just assume a function like this. So let F of X be a function which is a perfect square. And it is a perfect square of what? It is a perfect square of f of x minus lambda g of x where lambda is some real number. Okay. Now we know that any square of a number will always, any square of a function will always be greater than or equal to zero. Right. And if a function is always positive, so will be its integral. 
so i can say the square of this dx from a to b that will also be positive right let's open the brackets so let's square it up and open the brackets so it will become f square x okay plus lambda square g square x minus 2 lambda f of x g of x okay this would be greater than or equal to 0 right now let us uh, open this integral into different integrals so first i would take this lambda square term so lambda square since it is a constant will come out a to b g square x dx okay then minus 2 lambda a to b f of x g x dx then finally you have a to b f square x dx this should be greater than or equal to 0 okay now ultimately these are constants you can see that these terms will be constants only right because after evaluating the integral they would just come like a constant to you am i right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to treat this as capital a capital b and capital c correct so ultimately you see something like this a lambda square minus 2b lambda plus c greater than or equal to 0 correct no doubt so far now this is like a quadratic in lambda this is like a quadratic in lambda and if a quadratic if a quadratic is always positive what does it mean what does it comment about the nature of the roots first of all a is positive here because your a is up a is a integration of a positive function correct so if this is always positive means the graph doesn't have a real root it doesn't touch the x axis it doesn't cut the x axis so can i say discriminant here must be less than zero right in fact less than equal to also i can consider because here i am saying it is greater than equal to zero see why i am saying that is because if it is always greater than equal to zero it can be hanging like this or it could be touching like this but it will never cut and go down that is the meaning of saying that your uh, value of this is always greater than or equal to zero am i making sense guys please respond yes no yes sir aditya is a representative of you all <laughs> yes okay people are typing yes okay so discriminant less than s means what b square uh, in fact discriminant here will be b square means 4 b square minus 4 a c should be less than 0 that means you are trying to say b square would be less than a c correct yes or no if i take the under root on both the sides can i say mod b will be less than mod a c uh, you don't have to take a mod here because uh, under root is always positive. So mod b is under root of ac. Correct. What is mod b then? Just try to recall from here b is this. So mod b is like saying mod from a to b f of x gx is less than ac under root ac under root ac a is it is hidden actually a is this guy c is this guy so it would be from a to b f square into a to b a c i am writing so this is your term and hence the property is that fine again proof is not required but you should know how quadratic equation is actually helping you to come up with this property let's take a question on this prove that prove that integration from 0 to 1 under root of 1 plus x 
1 plus x cube dx will always be less than under root of or you can say less than equal to under root of 15 by 8 Type done once you're done. This should be a straightforward because you have already seen the property. It's just the application of the property, nothing else. I'll again write down the property for you. Mod of f of x into g of x is always less than under root of a to b f square x dx into a to b g square x dx. Okay, so here you can treat your under root of 1 plus x as your f of x. Okay, and under root of 1 plus x cube as your g of x. Okay. Please note you don't have to take a mod because it's going to be a positive answer because this is already a positive quantity and you're integrating from a lower value to a higher value. So that will be a positive answer. So this mod becomes redundant. So 0 to 1. You can write this if you want like this. Okay, because both are positive quantities individually as well. This will also be this will be less than 0 to 1 square of this square of this will be 1 plus x into square of this quantity which is 1 plus x cube correct so this will give you integration under root of integration of this is x plus x square by 2 okay from 0 to 1 into this is x plus x to the power 4 by 4 from 0 to 1 so one putting one will give you uh, one plus half that is three by two and putting a zero is zero. So I don't care about that value. And this will give you five by four minus zero. OK, so when you multiply ultimately it becomes 15 by eight. So this result can never be exceeding 15 by eight. Hence proved. OK. Does it make sense? Here, please type CLR if it is clear. Okay, so guys, before we end today's session, I have a question for all of you, which anyways, I will take more examples in the next class. And these type of questions have been, uh, you know, asked in J of late, where they want you to convert one integral in terms of another. Okay, they want to see how good you are in your substitution. Okay, uh, let, let's take a question. Let's take a question on this. Uh, let me ask you. Though it is an objective question, I'm making it as a prove that question because I don't want to write too much right now. So prove that. E to the power X T e to the power minus t square dt 
is e to the power x square by 4 0 to x e to the power minus t square by 4 d t so they are not asking you to evaluate this integral they are just asking you to convert one integral to another integral so what they will do is they will frame a question like this this integral is equal to which of the following integrals you don't have to find them separately you don't have to find uh, you know uh, the integral mentioned in the question and the integrals mentioned in the answer and see which results are same by some subtle substitution you need to convert one to the other how will you do this Okay, let, let me do this. See, uh, let me start with the left hand side. Okay, 0 to x e to the power xt into e to the power this. So basically, I can do this here. Okay, I can combine the e's together. Now, note that where I have to go, I have to prove the right hand side. So, what I'll do is I'll take an e to the power x square by 4 forcefully out. Okay, but for this I have to compensate with minus x square by 4 inside. Like this. Getting the point. Which is nothing but e to the power x square by 4. Okay, let me write it as 0 to x here. Okay. Take minus sign common so it will be like x square by 4 minus xt plus t square okay dt should not write dt on top it should this dt down here so far so good i'm just trying to inch towards the desired expression now this is nothing but 0 to x e to the power minus x by 2 minus t the whole square as you can see this is a perfect square this is a perfect square this is x by 2 minus t the whole square okay now we are very much close but we just have to show that this this will boil down to this term e to the power x t minus t square how will i show that I'm sorry, this will boil down to this term e to the power minus t square by 4. How will I show that? Simple, let's do one substitution. Let's put x by 2. Now, see, here, this has to be basically treated as t by 2, right? So you can actually put a variable y by 2 in place of that. Okay. So x by 2 minus t I am putting as y by 2 such that I generate a y square by 4 term as given in my right hand side. Okay. Now minus dt is same as dy by 2. 
correct okay so this integral will convert to e to the power minus y square by 4 dt will be minus dy by 2 minus dy by 2 note i have put a minus dy outside what about the limits of integration when t is 0 y is going to be x correct and when t is x y is going to be what is y going to be minus x okay see here when i put t as 0 y is going to be x and when i put t as x y is going to be minus x so this happens to the limits of the integration okay now since this is an even function remember even function property and first of all let me swap the position of the upper and the lower limit i don't want a negative sign in my expression so minus x to x e to the power minus y square by 4 dy by 2. now since an even function this is an even function try to recall this property minus a to a f of x dx if this function happens to be an even function it becomes 2 times 0 to a f of x dx i'm going to apply the same over. so 2 times e to the power x square by 4 0 to x e to the power minus y square by 4 dy by 2 2 to get cancelled now There is nothing in the name. That means I can put back my y as t again. There is nothing in the name. So I can rewrite this as 0 to x e to the power minus t square by 4 dt also. Right? There is nothing in the name. Okay. But please don't write such terms in the exam. This is just, I, you know, just to explain you, I'm writing such terms. Okay. Which is nothing but your RHS, which is nothing but your RHS. This is what I wanted to, sorry, this is what we wanted to prove here. Okay, so I started with LHS and I ended up in RHS. Next class when we meet, the agenda would be following. We'll do more questions on uh, integration by typical substitutions. Or converting one integral to another integral by typical substitutions. Number two, I'm going to use the uh, limit of a sum, definite integral as limit of sum, definite integral as limit of a sum. I'm going to do vice versa also, limit of a sum as definite integral. This is called the Riemann sums. Riemann sum. Okay. And finally, I'm going to talk about improper integrals. Improper integrals with special emphasis on the Wallace formula. This will be the agenda for the next class. I'm sure I'll be able to do this and start the new chapter with you uh, that you wanted to start with vectors. Next class, uh, uh, the exams are exams will be on. So it will be again an online session. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Over and out from my side. Bye bye. If you have any questions, Thank please you, let sir. me. Thank you so much.